Um, I am hoping that we are officially live on Facebook. I'm going to see if I can share and see the screen here to see this as well. For anybody that doesn't know, I am Jess Starr with Star Realty Group at Keller Williams Realty. And this is my good friend and my financial planner who I adore, Matt Carbray. With Thank Ridgeline. you, Jess. You're welcome. Ridgeline Financial Partners. Um, and they are located in Avon. They are awesome. We were talking today and I just thought this might be something that is of value to our community and to the stand up to COVID support Connecticut businesses community because you guys, you know, are struggling with a lot of stuff right now, just like, you know, all of us with businesses here in Connecticut and throughout the country with the current public health concern. So I thought it might be prudent to have Matt come on here and give us some tips and tricks as to what's going on with the current SBA loans and grants and what they're offering since he's done a lot of research. Yeah, there's so much information out there and thanks for having me, Jess. It's always great to talk to you and to other small business owners. This is a very difficult time for a lot of us and for those of us that are in business, depending on the business that you are in, some have been affected more than others, but the big initiative by the government has been the passage of the CARES Act. So a lot of people have probably heard to this point about what the CARES Act is going to provide to individuals the $1,200 per individual. If you're married, it's $2,400. For every child that you have under the age of 17, it's $500. So that part of the legislation was intended to help out individuals. You're more W-2 type uh, uh, worker. But the part of the CARES Act that has to do with small businesses is under seven sections, section 7A. And there's been a ton of information that's come out. It's been fast and furious. And as each day has gone by, what is now gonna be required, there's starting to be a little bit more transparency in terms of what you're gonna to have to get together, who's gonna to facilitate this process. Uh, the application is out there now, but there are three different forms of loans that could potentially turn into grants that are available. So uh, it's, uh, it's important for us to talk through each of those. So um, what I found really fascinating, ooh, sorry, there's a lot of background noise. I don't know if that was me. Um, what I found really fascinating about this was some of these are loans, some of these are actual grants. And what does grant mean? For those of us that might not know what a grant is, a grant I think is great because that's actually free money, people, that you don't know you could possibly get. And you know, a lot of us are struggling and we, might not have had the finances or the capital saved because we didn't expect this to happen in business. You know, like us, I'm in real estate, spring market's going great. It's super hot. Everybody's making offers. And then all of a sudden it gets a little cold because of what's happening. So, you know, tell us a little bit about that grant first, because that's the best news. I think that was the best news I heard all day. Yeah. Well, I'm going to put something up to the screen and you may all not be able to see it, but this is my actual application and I will read it to you. This is the COVID-19 Economic Injury Disaster Loan Application. It is out there on the SBA website. It took me 10 minutes to fill it out. Yeah. There are very few, and you did it as well, Jess, there are yeah. very few pieces of information that you actually are going to need to put this together. You're going to need to put in the name of your entity, the legal name, your That's federal your tax EIN ID, yep. Yep, your EIN. You're going to need to put your business address, uh, it's going to ask you your gross receipts. It's going to ask you your cost of goods sold. But unlike other sorts of applications that are out there that you are going to be required to fill out for some of the, the more advanced loans that are available, this was nothing more than filling out a two-pager. Uh, the basis for whether you're going to be eligible for this is not going to have anything to do with how much money you have. And, and what your business does. This is a $10,000 grant. And let's remember what a grant is. That is money that is given to you without the requirement to pay it back and without it being considered taxable income. Yeah. So if we're looking at the hierarchy of money that's out there, it all starts with grants because that's money that you don't have to pay back. Then it's very low interest and long extended loans. And then it's some of the shorter term loans that are out there. And then last but not least, it's some of the payroll tax forgiveness that exists for those of you that employ people 
in which you pay payroll taxes as an employer. So wait, Matt, so I'm going to make you slow down because I want to finish one and then we're going to move on to yeah. next. And I'm going to sure. ask some questions in layman's terms, okay? Absolutely. I'm going to keep it simple, stupid, just for me, just to make sure. And I'm going to think of the no questions problem. I might ask. So EIN number, you can find that. If you can't remember where you get that, you can get that probably from filing your taxes or from your CPA. Yes. Right? Correct. Other information like cost of goods and, you know, your gross uh, income and all that kind of stuff can also be found on your taxes that can you can call your CPA for that as well exactly or TurboTax if you do yeah, that yourself sure hopefully you have a CPA um, also maybe your profit and loss could be helpful with that could be yeah mm -hmm. what other resources would they need to use we use the state of Connecticut site for uh, well so the state of Connecticut there's not a lot Specific to the application that we're talking about, which is this $10,000 grant, as long as you have your tax return in front of you, that's all you really need. Okay. And most people have not filed their 2019 corporate tax return, or if you're sole uh, proprietor, your Schedule C. So I would say to you that get the tax return and that should be sufficient enough. Um, we just had Facebook Live die. Hang on. Oh, it died. Us. <laughs> oh, I think I just saw that. Okay. Hold on. We'll get we'll get Steve to get us back on. Okay. And then we're gonna record it too, so it's all right. No problem. Did you create this group, Jess? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So great. So if you know other people that would be super helpful to get yeah. in here to talk to small business owners. Yeah. I just wanted to motivate them and inspire them. We have so many clients that are, and they felt, you know, I saw them being pretty downhearted and, and you know, not, not seeing the light or not figuring out how to reinvent themselves and yeah. wanted them to have a place to talk or to have other people to lift them up. Sure. I thought that was important. Um, I th yeah, most certainly is. So now we're live on Facebook again, friends. Sorry. Apparently we only have a limited number of minutes. So we talked about a couple things where you can access um, the information you need for that first grant. That's a $10,000 grant you could get as a small business owner, not based on income, right? That is correct. Yeah, it does ask you for some basic financials specific to your business, but nothing about your personal finances. No personal financial supplement required. Okay, awesome. So let's move on to the next one. And guys, by the way, if we get cut off again, we are recording this, so we will post this in the group after. Feel free to ask any questions. Matt will be in the group too, so he'll be able to answer them. I'll tag him when we post it. Um, and he's also a resource in our community. He is a small business owner too. He has an office here in the firm of Valley and Avon. So, or reach out to me and I can connect you. So let's go to the second part. Yeah, so the first step really is to apply for that economic injury disaster loan. And then it's a matter of determining what type of impact the coronavirus has had on your business. Has it had an impact where it's resulting in a significant loss in revenue? Uh, because that's one form of the package. Or has it been that you're going to get through this, you may be struggling a little bit, but you're doing everything in your power to keep the employees that you have working for you still employed. And if I look at, again, the different types of loans, that some of them could be, become grants. The one that I would start with, if you do in fact have employees, is the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP. PPT, right? PPP, three P's in a row. Oh, I don't know why I said that. I must have been thinking about my kids, all this homeschooling. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's talk about the, the Paycheck Protection Program. The way that that effectively works is that they're gonna look at the payroll that you have had since February 15th of 2019 through June 30th of 2019. They're going to look to get what has been your average monthly payroll. So let's just say for argument's sake that your average has been $20,000. You're then gonna take that amount and you're gonna multiply it by 2.5 to arrive at the amount of a loan that you will be eligible for. So if we take 20,000, we multiply it by two and a half, we get a $50,000 loan. So when you apply for this PPP, that's the amount that you're going to be applying for. And then ultimately, once the loan is approved, they're gonna be looking at the eight weeks 
after the loan has been approved at what your payroll expenses were, what your rent expenses were, utilities, employee benefit costs such as group health insurance, any retirement plan contributions that are made at the employer level, and there's a couple of other different uh, line items in there, but depending on what those expenses are, they are going to potentially forgive up to $50,000 of that loan. That's crazy. Yeah, so if you had, as, as an example, $40,000 of payroll-based expenses and you had 40,000 relative to a $50,000 loan that was extended to you, they are going to forgive $40,000 of that $50,000 loan. This is huge. It's, it's such an incredible benefit. And what everyone needs to know is that the applications are out there. The window to start applying is tomorrow. And everyone is going to be in a rush to try and get their information in. And I'm not sure where the funding levels are going to be as time goes on, but I absolutely would prioritize starting that process as soon as you can. So Matt, you, the, the screen actually froze when you said the application deadline is, is it the deadline is tomorrow? No, the applications can start to be submitted okay. through the SBA tomorrow, which is Friday, April 3rd. Okay. Um, but this is all being done through the SBA, but in conjunction with SBA approved lenders. And I would so say almost every bank, is. yeah, so an SBA approved lender has to have been approved to do these Section 7A loans. And I have gotten information from almost every bank that's in our community. So unless you're dealing with an online-based lender, uh, which is like an Ally Bank or a TIA Bank, which used to be Evergreen Bank, I doubt that they are going to be considered Section 7A lenders. But... Uh, Webster Bank, Liberty Bank, TD, Bank of America, Santander. Uh, I've heard of, I mean, almost every bank that is prevalent and, and of any size in our community is going to be an SBA approved lender. And that is where applications are going to go through because the SBA is lending their own money, but they're having their member approved banks provide all of the different forms and the reports that go along with the application. So, okay, so that's great. So they can start applying tomorrow, and then how long do they have to apply? Uh, I believe it's June 30th, but that could even be extended. There's so much that's coming out. If you were to ask me two days ago what's required, I would have said one thing, and now I'm saying something a little bit differently. Uh, so get, get the process going tomorrow. I, I honestly think that the faster you get to this, the faster the money is going to be made available to you. And then that eight week clock starts so that once those eight weeks go by and you then provide the documentation to support, well, here was my payroll before, here's my payroll now, that's where the loan forgiveness is going to come in. Right now, the banks don't really understand who's going to be involved in that process of verifying things, whether the bank is going to have a liability for people that submit applications that aren't truthful. There's a lot of back and forth right now with the SBA and the banks, but what I do know is the process starts with the banks and then after the loan has been extended in terms of the supporting documentation, that most likely is gonna to go to the banks as well. Okay, okay, great. So that's great. So um, what else do we need to know about this PPT, PPP loan? Yeah, so I guess what you need to know is that it is, incentivizing businesses to keep their people on payroll. Because if you are going to be removing people from payroll, it asks you on the application, let me just pull mine up for reference here. Um, it asks you the number of employees right on the first page. So they're gonna wanna know how many employees you have today. And then when it comes time to going through the process of determining what is gonna be forgiven, they're going to want to know how many employees you have then. Mm -hmm. So a lot is going to factor into what you had versus what you then have. And 
the less people you have, the less forgiveness you're going to get. You know, and I think that's actually a really good lesson for a lot of people too. A lot of people are very fearful and, you know, without the revenue coming in, if they didn't have those reserves set aside in the different accounts they need to have for their businesses, what they did immediately was cut their staff or, you know, yeah. because payroll is usually the biggest thing that they have on their books. Sure. And this actually would be an incentive to keep the staff longer. And I know for us, we did everything we possibly could to cut everything but staff. Yeah, and it's a tough decision, right? When you're looking at a lot of uncertainty to come, yep. that's kind of one of the bigger expenses that most small businesses have. Yep. But as part of this, for those of you that may have laid off individuals, this could be a very good opportunity to think about getting those people back on board. Because remember, after the loan gets approved, if these people have gone off of payroll and they've come back on, that may help you in terms of how much of the loan is going to be forgiven. Yep. Uh, the one thing that I'm not yet certain about is, well, how about the case of the small business owner that he or she owns the building that they operate out of and they pay themselves rent? Is the SBA going to look and say, well, come on now. I mean, you're, you're in essence moving money from your left pocket to your right pocket. I don't know. Uh, I, I, haven't heard anything where they're really going to get into the weeds and they're going to say, uh, you know, who are you paying rent to? Um, so I know Amber Dodge is asking about where to find the form. Is, is that the PPP form you're looking for, Amber, I assume? Where can they find that form? Yeah, so uh, as of a couple of days ago, it was on the US Treasury website and I'm sure that it's still there, but it also is on the SBA website. So if you go to sba.gov, the first thing that you see is the Paycheck Protection Program uh, sample application form effective March 31st of 2020. So the SBA website is where you could go. The Treasury originally put it out there a couple of days ago, but go to sba.gov. So what we'll do too is when we reshare this with the group, we'll also make sure to put links so that people can access these things too. Yeah, That's sure. Easier. And there's a lot of great information from the U.S. Uh, Chambers of Commerce that talks about this in a very simple form. It's a four pager. It's got a lot of charts. You can kind of follow how, how the calculation is done. Again, they're looking at past payroll. Uh, they're saying what, what's your average monthly payroll. They're multiplying it by two and a half. It's giving you the total loan amount. They want to know the jobs. And again, um, let me see if I can just put this up here, protecting the innocent. I'll, I'll show you the top part of it just so people can see it. Protecting the innocent. <laughs> if anybody can see that. Um, it's no. just a white paper, however you're holding. There you go. All right. Paycheck Protection Program application form. Got it. You've got some numbers on there. Be careful. <laughs> yeah, no, these are just my, I mean, my address and everything else. But okay. so <laughs> that, that Paycheck Protection Program application is super easy. There's some questions that you have to answer um, that are more so <clears throat> kind of red flags. Have you been convicted of a felony? Have you yeah. ever, you know, those type of things that you would answer with any other sort of uh, loan or grant application. So get that done. ASAP. My lender also needed for me to pull together a bunch of different payroll reports, which I have since provided. That is going to be needed in conjunction with this application. And what your lender may require you to do, which I also did myself, is they wanted to see my projected cash flow for my business from March 27th through sometime in August. So I put all of uh, you know your beginning bank account balance and the revenue that you expect, and then there was line items for all the different expenses that we have as business owners. And I think that that's gonna play a role in this too. Um, I don't know how they're going to look at the millions of applications that they're gonna get and take what is $350 billion and distribute that within the system, but I always, I'm an advocate of give them everything and anything uh, so that you're prepared. And when they're looking at this to determine whether you're eligible or not, uh, you know, you've know you got everything that's necessary. Those that kind of send it in piecemeal, 
high probability that your loan's going to get held up. So give them uh, everything that you can possibly need. One of the things I have somebody texting us, um, Amber actually, and she said the actual PPP form isn't on the government site yet. If you happen to find the link or know the link and can just email it to me, Matt, that would be sure. awesome. Yeah. Um, and another person had messaged me and said they think that that um, might be released tomorrow. So that link. Yeah, well, again, it's already out there. I've already submitted mine and my bank has oh, it. Did? So yeah, it, it okay. absolutely is out there. If you do a, just a Google search and you put in PPP, which I'll do right now, loan application, uh, one of the first things that shows up is the SBA website, how to attain an SBA Corona. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there, but the actual application is right there on SBA.gov. So put in PPP loan application, and then you can download it. And uh, okay. you can't see my screen here just, but I have a blank one in front of me. It's four pages. Um, I wonder if we could share his screen. Um, so our, we also have another question from Peitu. She is a small business owner of Lighthouse Designs. I love all these guys. They're past clients of mine. So you guys rock. By awesome. the way, Amber Dodge has timeless designs. They do clothing. My shirt that I'm wearing and the hats they did for Star Realty Group are awesome. Peitu is awesome. Lighthouse Designs too. But she's asking, um, she's a small business owner and doesn't have employees. Uh, there's only two owners. Can they apply for this PPP? Yes, they can. Oh. So I have two clients. Um, it's a very similar situation. They are owners. They do not have any employees. And they are also eligible for the PPP. Uh, the first thing that I told them to do is exactly actually what I did for myself and what I advocated for you to do, Jess, which, which was to fill out that economic injury disaster loan application first, which is the 10000 that we've all, hopefully by now we're all aware of. But, that was done immediately. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then the Paycheck Protection Program, If it depends on what type of structure you are. So if you're an S corporation, well, you're on payroll, so you would have that payroll data. If you're not, it's going to look for your Schedule C information. Uh, if you're a 1099 employee, for all my realtor friends watching, how would that um, affect them or apply if they're if they're just an individual agent let's say and they're or even if they're an agent on a team and they're a 1099 employee could they apply for that small business loan yes ah so really yes that's amazing yeah it is so that's why there's just so much confusion out there about all of this is people are sitting there saying well I'm self-employed I'm 1099 I'm not considered uh, a self-employed individual. Yeah, you absolutely are. So I, I was talking to an accountant the other day who is a sole proprietor and he's not even incorporated. He's not even an LLC. It's just Jim Smith uh, CPA services and he's eligible for that $10,000 grant and he's also eligible for the PPP. Let me ask you a question then with that. If that's the case, then how do they have an e does everybody need to have an EIN number? Do they all get an EIN number? No, this so might be a foolish a, question. Sorry. No, it's a good question. So what it actually says on the application here is your business TIN tax identification number or social security number. So uh, you don't need to have an EIN. Okay, good. To be able to apply for this. Yes, that's so exciting. So basically, all individual realtors. Could also apply loan officers could also apply yeah the one thing that i'm not sure right is with respect to those that are self-employed so what are they going to look at as the basis for how much of a loan that you can get um you know because the way that this ppp works is if you have people that are on payroll they are going to cap anybody who makes above a hundred thousand so whether it's you whether it's an employee if they're paid one hundred and fifty thousand they're going to be looked at as though they're only making a hundred thousand. So yeah. if, if you're a 1099 realtor and let's just say for argument's sake, you're above the hundred thousand, my guess is that they're going to look at a hundred thousand. They're going to divide it by 12. That's your average monthly payroll. They're going to multiply that by two and a half. And that's what you may be eligible for. Now what I don't know they're going to do 
is look at in terms of the forgiveness and say how much is going to be forgiven because it, it goes against what this whole program was set up to do, which is companies that are keeping people on payroll and the forgiveness is based on that. So still a lot to come out on that. Uh, I haven't heard anything yet to this point about how they're going to treat those that are self-employed uh, when you factor in the forgiveness. So could those self-employed people, the 1099s, would they be able to apply for the economic injury disaster loan? Yes, and that's where they should start. Uh, I'm that's where I would see sure. them doing it first. Yeah. So like people like Paytu, that has a small, she's a small business owner in Amber, they could apply for that. And like individual 1099 single agents or even agents on teams could get that $10,000 loan. Absolutely. And uh, again, they could also most likely qualify under the Paycheck Protection Program the part of it that's unknown if they do not in fact have employees or the employees are themselves and they're putting themselves on payroll, how is it all going to work in terms of the forgiveness? Mm. That part is still up in the air. Everything that we've been dealing with has been with businesses that have employees other than the owner. Yeah. You know, yeah. but listen, I think you apply for everything possible. And once you determine whether you have been approved or not, it's at that point that you decide, do I really need the loan or do I not? And if I do need the loan, well, you probably should take it because the terms are as good as anything that you're ever going to get. The terms that we're looking at for the PPP, a 1% interest rate. That's crazy. Yeah. a one And, and a six-month deferment on when payments start. And from what I'm seeing, it's a two-year repayment. So... Ideally, if we can all get through this together and get back to our normal routines and get our businesses operational again, we should have plenty of time to be in a position to pay this off. Uh, so really, really good program, as good of any program that I've seen, even going back to 08 and 09, the stimulus that's available here is far superior to anything that was available back then. So, so um Two things. One, there's a question I'm going to ask you real quick, sure. too. Um, but two, with that um, PPP loan that you could get with that 1% interest rate, we had even talked about it. You know, it would be smart to take that loan, see what they're going to forgive on that. And then if you're a company or a business that actually has the funding and don't like to keep debt, you can also not take the rest of it or pay it back immediately so you don't have to pay the 1% interest. Yeah, there's no prepayment penalties at all. So take as much as someone's willing to give you. You may find, depending on how long this goes and what effects that this has to your business, that you could use it. Uh, but right. again, the more you take, the more potential there is for forgiveness. And right. if you, as an example, are eligible for $100,000 and 50000 of it's going to be forgiven, uh, it doesn't say that you have to use all 100,000. You can decide to pay back that other 50,000. Right. So that's, I think that's another amazing option too. So you have it as an option. You don't have to use it. You can give it all back, the portion that you want to give back and keep what yeah. they gave you. Sure. Um, yeah. So and one last thing, Jess, is with the money that is forgiven, one, you don't have to pay it back. But secondly, it's not considered taxable income. Oh, that's awesome. Yes. So, you know, sometimes when you have debt that's forgiven, such as in the case of, uh, you know, if you have a, a credit card company that you negotiate with and they forgive 20000 of your debt and you feel like you've won, well, then you get a tax bill for a discharge of indebtedness and you have to pay tax on it. That is not yeah. the case here. This is the best form of money that you could possibly get because you don't pay it back and you don't have to pay taxes on it. Right. So that's great. So this, hopefully you guys are finding this useful. I think this is amazing. Now we have another question. Um, the lovely Christy DeConti is asking if she has a um, child care center and when everything started coming out, she actually closed her doors and it was probably one of the right things to do for her just because of everything going on. And yeah. um, she was asking if she should hire back her employees she laid off in order to get the loan. So that's a really good question. Now, the what I would say to you is it's it's a two-part answer, right? Do you really need those people uh, to run your operation? And then secondly, you have to look at the criteria 
that's going to factor into the forgiveness. So they're going to look back and want to say, how many employees did you have at a given moment of time? And then eventually they're going to want to look to see how many employees that you have uh, during that repayment uh, type, that eight week period. So for those employees that you do hire back, that's going to result in more potential forgiveness. For those employees that you do not hire back, it's going to reduce in lesser. So you almost kind of have to, to put pen to paper and do a break even analysis to say, if I hire back these employees, it's going to come at a cost of X, but the forgiveness has the potential to be Y. So I am strongly recommending that anyone who's thinking about going down this road, the steps are to get in touch with your CPA, get in touch with your commercial banker, because again, everything is being done through these SBA Section 7A lenders. And I've been doing a lot of that over the last couple of days in preparation for tomorrow with getting CPAs and bankers on the phone together to make sure that we're getting all the information for the application. But you need to get everybody on the same page. And that really needs to start tomorrow, if at all possible, because that's when the window is opening up for application. So I don't have a, a real perfect answer for Christy, but what I would say is you need to look at how not hiring someone back is going to affect you based on uh, the ratio of how many you had prior to the coronavirus versus how many you're going to have on payroll you know, during that eight-week period. So this is what I'm just thinking of a question for her. So if she had, you know, let's say eight employees total and yeah. she let them go besides the owners of the business um, and it was due to the public health concern, she had children there and she wanted to take care of them, obviously, and do the right thing, which I called her and congratulated her on because I thought that that was such a noble thing to do. Yeah. And I know there's other businesses that still stayed open. Um, so that being said, if she's able to hire them back, once everything has finally cleared, and will they look at that like, hey, she did the right thing by letting them go now, you know, the right thing for the children, and obviously there was no children here, so she didn't need all the employees and the doors weren't open, and now she's back? Or is it just that she needed to have them continuously there? Yeah, so unfortunately, because this is covering every single industry across the board, there's not a test or a component of the pro provision and legislation that says, well, you were a really good person and you did the right thing mm -hmm. and you did what, what was in the public's best interest and trying to help to curb the spread of this and some of our most vulnerable. It's, it's not looking at it that way, unfortunately. It's looking at it and saying, how many employees did you have? How many employees do you have now? And, and that's why in her particular case, it may be difficult to put people back on payroll just for the sake of doing it to maybe get some loan forgiveness. So you, you got to really kind of run the numbers and take a look and see whether it is in fact worthwhile to get these people back employed because the forgiveness may not be the equivalent of what it's going to cost you in payroll costs. And the other thing too is laying people off is one of the most difficult decisions that most business owners ever have to make. But with the CARES Act, and this is specific to individuals, the federal government is kicking in up to another $600 a week on top of what the state of Connecticut is giving out. And they're doing that for four months. So not many people are aware of this. We all care about our employees. I've decided to keep everybody on board because I really need to in light of what's going on here. Um, but other businesses may not be as fortunate because they're effectively shut down because they've been shut down by the state and other mandates. Uh, but you know, again, what I think is important with, with all of this is to realize that your employees are actually in a fairly decent position. So if you really care about your employees, which I think we all do, realize that with the federal stimulus that's being provided on top of what the state of Connecticut is providing, our employees all should be in a pretty good place. Okay, um, we have Amber asking sure. about percentages on the sizes of loans that she thought 5% under 350, 3% if higher, 
and loans greater than two million were one percent. See, I don't know what she's referencing. Yeah, I do. So what she's referring to is the other loan that we may have talked about earlier on, which is uh, you know remember how we talked about that grant, that ten thousand dollar grant, the economic injury disaster loan application. So the first thing to do, as I told everyone on this call, is to apply for that. But what that actually is is an extension and it is, uh, you know, they're forwarding you money towards what could be a much larger loan. So for those businesses that have had an incredible reduction in revenue and profitability, they could apply for that loan. Now, she is in fact correct, correct. depending on the size of the loan is going to determine the interest rate and the repayment terms. I'm hearing that these loans can be stretched out for almost as long as 30 years. And the interest rate is, is going to be higher than the PPP. But there's nothing that precludes you from applying for all three of these. And I have a lot of businesses that are applying for all three. Why not? And then when you figure out what has been made available to you, then you can decide, well, you know what? I want the PPP because I feel like I'm gonna get a lot of forgiveness from that. Uh, but you know what, maybe I also could use the economic injury disaster loan as well because my business is off 50, 60%. Yeah. So you don't have to pick and choose. I would apply for everything, especially if you feel as though you're going to need it and then make a determination after you've been approved what capital you wanna access first. Okay, so and that's the, that would kind of be the final step out of all of them? Yeah, and you can really get the two uh, loan-based programs accomplished at the same time. So the economic injury disaster loan, so you get 10,000, which is kind of extended to you. And if you are eligible for additional, they'll reduce whatever you get by that 10,000. Uh, okay. So after you do that, then you apply for above and beyond 10,000, up to 2 million. And then what you also would apply for is the Paycheck Protection Program as well. Uh, the first 10 grand that's free, take it, obviously. The Paycheck Protection Program, because of the loan forgiveness, that's really the second place to, term, to turn if, if that's relevant to your situation. Or if your business has just absolutely been torn apart by this. And if we think about businesses that fall into that category, it's anything that is restaurant oriented, hotels, anything travel, leisure, uh, they're most likely going to be applying for the economic injury disaster loan application because most of those employers have completely laid off all of their staff, maybe absent a, a select few. So there are three different programs um, and most of you should probably apply for all three. What was the third one called though? So there's really two programs. The one that I, I'm calling the free $10,000 is part of the economic injury disaster loan. So that's the one that Amber was referencing where there's potentially $2 million out there. It's that they're extending to you the first 10,000, which we're all going to get when we apply for it. But if you apply for more above and beyond that, let's just say you get 200,000, they're ultimately gonna send you 190,000 because they've already given you 10,000. Okay. And then there's the PPP. But, but that there's three different steps. That 190 would be in loan form. Yes, it would be in loan form. And there's no forgiveness on the economic injury disaster loan. There's only forgiveness on the PPP, okay. other than the 10,000 that is, is a grant and is not a loan. Okay. And then the only other thing that I think I had seen out there was there was something, and I think it was income-based, but something for a number of children, $1,200 or something like that? Yeah, that's great. So that's what I referenced uh, the other night on, on NBC30, where the amount that is available is $12,000 per person. If you're married, uh, it's $2,400. If you're head of household, it's $1,200. Um, there are income parameters by which if you are above those, you either are going to get nothing or a reduced amount. So in the case of being single, it's 75,000 up to 99,000. 
So if you're below 75, you're gonna get 1,200. If you're, and again, it's your adjusted gross income, which is slightly different than your gross income. There are a couple of things that go into reducing down your gross income to your adjusted gross income. It's actually on your tax return. So if you have filed your 2019 tax return, you'll look to the bottom of the first page of your 1040, and there's a line item for adjusted gross income. If that number, let's just say, is 125,000 and you're single, you are not gonna qualify for any of the subsidy. If you're below 75,000, you're gonna get 1,200. If you're between 75,000 and 99,000, it is going to be slightly phased out. So you will get a partial amount. If you're married, it's 150,000 to 198,000. So effectively it's double. And that's if you don't have any children. If you have two children, that limit that was 198 goes up to 218,000. And the definition of a child that would qualify is it has to be a child that you claim as a dependent, which is key. And it has to be a child that is under the age of 17. What about four kids? <laughs> yeah, listen, Jess, um, the more the merit. I'm just asking. Yeah, so, um, but what's important to understand about this is that they're gonna look at your 2019 tax return. If you have not filed your 2019 tax return, they're gonna look at your 2018 tax return. So if you're on the borderline here of whether you're gonna qualify or not, there's some planning here. You know me, I'm always thinking about planning yeah. and things that you can do to maybe uh, strengthen your case to get some money here. If you had a really uh, good 2019, but a not as good 2018, you may want to not consider filing your 2019 return right away because they'll look to your 2018 return to determine whether you qualify or not. And then there is a test that the government is, is going to have where they're going to look next year and say, well, geez, based on your 2020 return, would you have qualified or not? Because again, the coronavirus is impacting more people in 2020 than it is in past years. And if you would have qualified in 2020, but you didn't in 2019, you will be eligible for money. But if in 2020, they look back and they say, well, geez, okay, now you filed your 2019 tax return, they're going to not take back that money. So they so will not come back looking for that money. If you said, base everything on my 2018 return, because your 2018 return, let's say you're married for a second, your adjusted gross income, and let's say you don't have any kids for a second, was 148,000. But in 2019, your adjusted gross income is 202,000. You're not gonna qualify based on your 19 return, but you're gonna qualify based on your 18 return. So I would not file your 19 return until you get the stimulus, because they're gonna look back to your 18 return. And then in, when you go to file it after the fact, and they look back on it, there's nothing in the law that says they can take that money back from you. So you really wanna understand your adjusted gross income in 18 relative to 19, and before you hit the send button on filing your tax return, just know what those limits are. So when you see your adjusted gross income for, you know, keep it simple, stupid, what area are you looking at on your tax return? Yeah, so it's really the bottom line on, uh, let me see if I can find it, Jess, but it's on yeah. your 1040. Like, be specific with people. What section of your 1040 do they need to look at to know their numbers? Yeah, so <laughs> let's see here. Sorry, I'm a pain in the butt. You know that. No, no. Yeah, I want to just make sure that, sure that this is as clear as it possibly can. I know they've been changing this around a little bit, so... Get, uh, I'll pull up section 1040 here. So whatever. And as you look for where that adjusted number sure. is um, for income, I wanted to know when will they start sending these checks out? And what is this? What's the name of this stimulus? Uh, it's called, it's called the CARES Act. The CARES Act for the 1200 or the 2400. Yes. So 2019, let's see. 
Adjusted okay. gross income. It's line 37. So it's, it's actually the last line on the first page of your 1040, which is your, which is your tax return. So line 37, do you say? Line 37. Okay. Yep. Line 37, page one of your 1040. Look at that number. <laughs> yeah. It's, so, an it's an incredibly important number. It's the number by which whether you can make an IRA contribution is based on and have it be deductible, whether you can do a Roth IRA contribution. It helps determine whether you're eligible for certain additional uh, child tax credits that are out there. Um, I mean, we could talk for hours about this, but the SECURE Act, which became law in 2018, got rid of the ability for you to claim dependence on your tax return. But there are still some credits that are out there uh, outside of the old personal exemption. Um, but the adjusted gross income drives all of that stuff. And in this case, it drives the stimulus. And I see that there's a question from Kathy. Yes. Is the 500 a child based on your children on taxes? I'm, I'm guessing that she's asking whether it's based on how many children you have. The answer to that is yes. So if you're Jessica Starr, you are going to get 500 per child for a total of 2,000. If you're married, you're going to get 1,200 times 2, 2,400 plus 2,000. You're going to get a check for $4,400. Oh, so wait, that's totally separate. Yes. So it's above and beyond the 1,200. So tell me what that's called, the 500 a child. Yes, these money makers. <laughs> it, it's called having a lot of children. No, there's nothing that is specific to it. That milk it's, is it's expensive. <laughs> yeah, it's all part of the CARES Act that is specific to individuals. So remember, each individual, 1,200. Spousal, 1,200. Each child under 17 who's considered a dependent, 500 per child. So they're talking, and when are they supposed to be sending these checks? Or Yeah. So they said three weeks, Jess. So that was three weeks from a couple of days ago. The people that file their 2019 taxes are likely going to see that before people that have not. So if you know that you're going to qualify, if you know you're going to be above those income limits and you don't have to kind of play that game where, you know, your 18 is going to put you in a much more favorable position than 19, well, then go and get your return filed ASAP not only are you most likely do a refund because most people get a refund, especially if you're a W-2 employee, um, business owners, whole different story, but um, filing your return, especially if you do a refund, that's where your stimulus check is going to go. Because when you file your tax return, you provide banking information if you are in fact do a refund. And the IRS is going to be sending the checks which aren't going to be physical checks, they're going to be sending those dollars right to your bank account. I'm laughing because Amber Dodge is at it again. Read her question. <laughs> oh, Amber, okay. Is there a cap on the number of kids? No. no. Oh, phew, I can keep going. Keep going. <laughs> there is no cap on the number of kids. All right, awesome. So, I mean, I think this was incredibly informative. I know I was thrilled to hear this and I hope this puts a little pep in some of our business owners steps. That's what yeah. my goal was tonight. Um, ideally, we're going to start doing some of these to motivate everybody, get some momentum going and keep our economy going here in Connecticut, because that's very important. Um, Peitu is also asking um, if you're divorced with three kids, I would assume that that would be the 1200 and then 1500. So 1200 for you pay two and 1500, depending upon your income. Yeah, depending on your income, you could file head of household where those income thresholds actually, uh, it's, it's almost, I think it's somewhere in the middle. I want to say it's 112000 if you're head of household that they're going to look to as your threshold. But what is most important is who has the right to claim kids as a dependent right. on the tax return. So you can't deduct children anymore as uh, for personal exemption purposes. But dependent, who, who claims them as a dependent is going to be important. And most people that get divorced, a divorce decree is going to determine who gets them in what years, if not all years. So 
um, yeah, it's going to depend on how you file your return and whether your kids are on your return as a dependent or not. Yes. So I hope you guys found this useful. Matt, are there any other tips and tricks that we should be looking to do at this time? No, I would just encourage everyone to get on this. The money is not endless. I feel strongly that of the stimulus that's going to be pushed out into the system, that the monies that are gonna go the fastest are gonna be the small businesses because the government is going to more so control monies going to large corporations. So I would make this a priority. We're not talking about small amounts of monies that are being made available. And this is a once in a lifetime um, opportunity for you to get the, the money that you may very well need to keep your business going, but also uh, to have incredibly favorable loan terms and then lastly, the potential to have those loans forgiven, which is awesome. That's awesome. You know, um, one other thing I want to mention too, because I know as business owners, you know, we look to cut things and cut expenses and trim wherever we can. And if we're doing that as business owners, we should be doing that on a monthly basis anyway, never mind when a pandemic happens. That should just right. be a good business habit to have. It's just good business. Absolutely. So here's the thing. One of the things I was going to do in my frantic panic was potentially cut investing for a little while, just put it on hold into my own retirement to make sure. And I keep substantial savings just four times like this. And yet that was one of the things I was going to cut because I just wanted to make sure I had even more just in case you never know. And then I thought realistically, and I had a, I have amazing people I surround myself with that are much smarter than me, just like Matt Carberry. So that's why I count on them when I'm making decisions. So I reached out to him just to ask a question if I put some stuff on hold. And he said, Jess, if you're investing in your future and your retirement, why wouldn't you want to keep investing into those things when you're buying them at a third of the value they typically are when the market does rebound? So I would still encourage you if you do have those extra funds, that's my, my piece of advice because I realistically snapped out of my mindset and go, oh my God, what am I doing? The most money to be made ever is when there is a shift in the economy. So although it seems fearful and although it seems scary and sad, you can also do very, very well if you're smart with your dollars and cents. So keep investing into your retirement if you can. Um, you know, that was a really important lesson. So Matt, you can talk about that real quick if you want. Yeah, the hardest thing to do is to continue to throw money into a market and into any sort of investment when everything is telling you to do the opposite. But you touched upon it, Jess. The old saying by Warren Buffett is to be greedy when others are fearful and to be fearful when others are greedy. Exactly. We very much so have an environment where everyone is fearful. And if we look at all of the past bear markets, corrections, recessions, however you want to categorize it. We live in an incredible resili resilient country that has proven time in and time out that we've been able to get through these periods. And this is something like nothing else that we've ever seen, uh, at least in modern history, where a health-related global pandemic has really driven our economies to the, the point they're at a standstill. But I feel confident that whether it's the medical community, whether it's just our own human behavior and us being smarter and thinking about our fellow neighbors, that we're going to get through this. We're going to get back to our normal routines. We're going to get back to having our businesses open and vibrant and people coming through our doors. Um, and that's why I feel strongly that those that are investing now uh, and continuing to invest are going to be much better for it because you're effectively buying into a stock market that is 30% off its high, which was really just a month ago. So mm -hmm. stay committed. Um, if in fact you can afford to continue to do it, that would be one of the last things that I would, would cut. Um, keep saving. You'll be better for it in the long term. And you know what? It's still always good to have that nest egg. Sure. You know There's something to be said for always having a nest egg too. My, my daddy taught me that. And so yeah. I always have. So I great, thought that, great. that was something. Really good advice. Yeah. I mean, listen, no one ever thought that we would be at this point, but I think what we can take from this is the importance of having emergency reserves, the importance of having lines of credit that you can access. I always tell my clients, 
get a line of credit. And they often say, well, Matt, I don't need it. I said, that's exactly why you need to get it. Because when you need it, it's going to be very hard for you to get it. So I, I would say as soon as we get out of this, it's incredibly important to build that six to 12 months of money that you can get your hands on in the short term and then get a line of credit. It doesn't cost you anything if you're not using those funds, but have it available to you. It can make a big difference. Matt, I love you. You're amazing. Love How you can too. people reach you if they need any advice, if they need an amazing financial planner? I know I'm so blessed to have you. I found you years ago and I will be forever in your debt because you're amazing for us. So how can people reach you? Yeah, so it's uh, my email is matt with two T's at ridgelinefp.com. So that's M-A-T-T -T at ridgeline, F as in Frank, P as in Paul.com. I am on social media. We have a Ridgeline Financial Partners page. We also are on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I do a lot of uh, media type stuff. So we try and put content out there for the average person that can make a difference, albeit small, but you know, we're always trying to put stuff about the importance of saving for college, some of the state tax, tax benefits that are available to you, um, the importance of having wills and trusts and all that stuff. So. Uh, Hopefully you can join us on social media and, and pick up a couple of things from the content that we put out there. And we love to hear from you. So if you do have questions and we weren't in a position to answer it, feel free to send me an email and uh, we most certainly will get back to you. We'll make sure to drop all of Matt's info in there as well. And Matt is also part of this Stand Up to COVID-19 group. So we need to empower the members of our group to keep using this, inviting other people and building our community. That's a really big deal. And we appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you all for your questions in here. I'm just Star with Keller Williams and Star Realty Group. And I am just so grateful to have every one of you guys here with us tonight. So hopefully you got some great tips and tricks and we look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks. <laughs>